through 11. That's on page 93. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there, were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. For the word of God in scripture, from the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Those of us who grew up in small town America know that celebrations were something that the whole community looked forward to because there wasn't a lot of wealth in these communities. And so this the opportunity to gather and to celebrate as a community was something that the whole community looked forward to. And I've seen that also in urban settings, particularly in the African-American church tradition. I mean, if there is a funeral or a wedding, everybody turns out. Great food, great celebration, great community. Cana is a little bitty town north of Nazareth a little bit, and it appears at more than once in the Gospel of John. This wedding party that we hear about today in these communities were a celebration that lasted several days. It just wasn't an afternoon affair. Uh, they were really partying and uh, celebrating this wedding. Now, I think the gospel leaves a verse out. If you recall, it starts out with the announcement that they're there, Jesus, his mother, the disciples, and then this tragedy, wine, runs out. How can you have a party without good wine? And so Mary, who had gotten this word from an angel who knew that Jesus was the chosen one, and we've been hearing through the season different texts that talk about God's divine human form in Jesus. And so we know from our readings and learnings that not only is Jesus human, but he is divine and all powerful. And so Jesus's mother turns to Jesus and asks him to produce some wine. Now, mothers are always asking their oldest son to do something. It seems like I know my mother never hesitated whenever she needed something to do, to ask her oldest son to go do it for her. And 
And that's what I imagined was taking place this day. Here was Jesus, the oldest son. They were out of wine, and she asked the older son to solve the problem, to go get some wine. The part that I think is missing has to do with the fact that Jesus talks back, back to her. This isn't my time, Mom. Why, what does this have to do with you or me? Now, the part that I think's left off is what I've come to call the mother's look. I can remember growing up that if my mother was singing in the choir, or even sitting in the same pew, if I got to being too loud or acting up, she didn't have to say anything. She just gave me that mother's look that just looked right through you and you knew you better pay attention. Not a word was said. And I can't help but believe that that is the missing part of this story. Because Jesus suddenly all of a sudden agrees to do it, right? Yeah. So you go from this talk back to obedience to his mother's wish. Now there's other historical explanations of why Jesus may have been reluctant to do it. Maybe, as some people suggest, the party had gotten out of hand and everybody was so drunk that Jesus felt like they just didn't really need any more wine. It won't be the last time that people accuse the disciples and those around Jesus of being drunk. But somehow that seems like an easy excuse to explain it away. Another explanation that you run into is that it is an affront to Jesus's and in this way God's divine nature. It's beneath him that, that God's not someone that is a merchant, someone who provides goods and services to the people. But I don't think Jesus is stoops to that. I think Jesus is above that, as is God. And then there's the explanation that John himself gives in the gospel, and that it has to do with God's control of timing. That this request from his mother was requiring of Jesus, God incarnate, to step out of his agenda, his timeline, his understanding of his purpose in life, and meet the need of this party. However you want to talk about this reluctance, it has come to be known, by some at least, that as a scandal. The scandal of a reluctant God. Why would God be reluctant to help no matter what the request is? But then most of us have been at some place in life, I suspect, I know I have, where no matter how hard I prayed and no matter how righteous I think I might have been, it feels like God is not listening or God is absent. I've heard mothers talk about crisis of faith because they keep praying for a family member over and over and nothing seems to change and they wonder, is God even here? Is God listening? Now we can all go through life and things happen, as they say. Bad things can happen to good people. And it is hard for us who are part of this tradition that celebrates the abundant love and grace and presence of God always among us to come to an understanding why God is not present in what we individually might think is our hour of need. And that's a scandal. 
it makes us unbalanced. It unhinges us some way because it messes with our faith. It messes with our belief. So what do we do? What do we do? Particularly in the African-American tradition, I have often heard it said, God always provides at the right time. So in some ways, this is less about the timing of our need and our anxiety and our frustration and our longing for God to intervene and do something about what we consider to be the most important problem in the universe, our problem, whatever that may be. And so when that doesn't happen by some magical event, it feels like God's not listening. God's not there. But what John and what this story has intended for those who hear it through the generations to understand is that people of faith have to live their lives even in what seems like an absence of God or a challenge to their faith with this belief, this faith that God is there even if we don't recognize it. Even if God does not respond at the time that we think God should be responding. And so we are invited to understand that life in its ups and downs requires people of faith to be constant in that faith. To have unrecognizable or unintelligible, a mystery beyond recognition, that God is in our lives no matter what. And that that presence is there presence is there in our lives whether we recognize it or not. We are invited to trust God. And when we're hurting or when something is going wrong or we're in grief, it's hard to trust. There are some things in life that just eat at the very core of our faith and our trust. When things go bad, they can really go bad. But that's what this story is about. It is the first sign of God's divinity through Jesus. That his ability to be present at this party, which is, he's not healing someone who's sick. He's not helping the blind to see. He's not casting out demons. He's taking water and turning it into wine. And let there be no mistake, it's not just a little bit of wine. We're talking about six jars that hold 25 to 30 gallons. That's a lot of wine. Hard to imagine what kind of party they had. <laughs> But the point is God's love and grace is overflowing in its abundance. And that our expectations that we place on God based on our needs are really vanity. That we need to let that go or recognize it for what it is. And just trust God. Trust that God is here with us. Trust that God is aware of what's going on in each of our lives. Trust God that he hears our prayers, even when we, for whatever reason, cannot hear God's response. And trust that in God's mercy and grace, we will live not in any ordinary sense, 
but we will live as the resurrected body of Christ. That we will live among the saints of all times. That we will be equal active members of a kingdom of God. And that together, even though we have different gifts and we're different people, in this kingdom, we are all one. Amen.